As I was saying, we've got Joe Thomas here with us today. He's our managing director um, of the Ballast Water Management System at uh, Vatsila. Uh, and we're going to be talking a little bit um, more interactively than having a, a, a PowerPoint presentation because I think a lot of the issues around ballast water management um, need to be discussed rather than presented. So let's start with the, with the um, possibly the most burning issue on everyone's mind, um, the legislative environment. How do you see that evolving and, and what's the latest update uh, on that front? The legislation is something that everybody's asking about and um, there's not been that much progress in, in recent years, at least not the speed that we wish to, to see that progress. Um, until this year, when the US Coast Guard themselves um, put into place their own legislation, um, and that was written into the Vessel General Permit for 2013, which comes into force um, in December. So this in itself is a big step forward with regard to regulation, because now, from December this year, any ships that operate in US waters will have to comply with what's in that vessel general permit with regard to ballast. And there is a process that, that has to be followed to get an approval, specifically for the US uh, waters. And, and people will have to address that issue as well as the IMO side, which continues on. Um, it's not accelerating as fast as we would like, but there has been movement. Sweden, Switzerland uh, were the most recent country to sign up to it about a month ago. And there is some rumors that Sweden are very close and also Singapore are considering. So we do move ever closer to, to the, the ratification of the IMO um, legislation. And further to that, the MEPC last year, last meeting, um, agreed a change to the implementation plan, which is um, being put in front of the IMO assembly in November for acceptance. And this will effectively add more time for the ship owners to comply with the requirement. And this was suggested as, a, as an amendment to actually accelerate the ratification process. So I think there's a lot happened this year to really move legislation on, and hopefully with um, the changes in the implementation, relaxing that a little bit for ship owners, there'll be more acceptance of that for the IMO as well. Okay, so would you recommend that, um, that customers wait until there is a ratification, or do you recommend that they get started? I think um, it always makes sense to plan ahead, and certainly for owners that have many ships in the fleet, that have a lot of dry dockings um, in the coming years, there is um, the option for planning ahead and to avoid any bottlenecks in both equipment's delivery and also to be able to get the equipment that they want from a credible supplier, for example, um, then perhaps it'll be easier to do that if they make a start um, earlier rather than later. So I think there is a very, very big need to do that. Many owners are recognising that, um, but there are other owners that are waiting for legislation to force them. Uh, if they're operating in the US, that's now there. And that's not something that's commonly known, actually. Sure, sure, sure. And um, uh, you mentioned suppliers. Uh, are, there, are there quite a few uh, ballast water management system suppliers on the market? And what's your view on that? Are there too many, or are there not enough? Well, yeah, every time I come to an exhibition, it's like somebody has a magic wand, and more suppliers um, appear from nowhere. Um, yeah, there's, there's 60 or 70 people out there actively engaged in developing technology and um, that's a lot of people. Um, for sure the cost of investment is significant and everybody is faced with the same challenge to actually meet a certain requirement. That's going to be doubly difficult now because the US have their own legislation which requires separate testing. So I think there's going to be a lot of suppliers that might find it difficult to continue the investment at the level necessary to get all of the approvals that the ship owner will demand of them. So um, in the future I do see that the ballast water market will shrink and I, and I think there will be um, a big challenge for those that are left, but there won't be 60 or 70 people in a few years' time. I think it will condense quite a lot. Sure, sure. And how are you, how are you guys coming along with your approvals? What's, uh, what's the update on that? In terms of approvals, all of our work is almost finished. We got the type of approval for the UV system last year, about a year ago. Um, with the EC system using an active substance, we've had to go through the IMO procedure um, for basic and final approval before we can apply for type approval. But the application for type approval was submitted back in June, and they told us four months turnaround. So, you know, here we are in October, and we're expecting it right now. Fingers crossed. Well, no, not fingers crossed. We've done all the work. Okay. We so passed the testing. Yeah. It's waiting for the administration to catch up. Okay. Yeah. Very good. And. Um, 
I think probably we'll come to the last question now, unless there's anything from the floor. Um, what's the point of having technology choice? Um, for example, if in the US there are big question marks on uh, the UV system. Well, our strategy right from the beginning was really to try and give the customer what he needs. And on that basis, um, no one technology fits every ship type and every ship size. So it was, it was something quite obvious to us at the beginning that we needed to have a solution for the owner which provided that choice of technology. That's why we have the UV and the EC. So when we go to the owner, of course we have a product, but actually what we're trying to do is sell our expertise in making the right choice for his ship. Um, his ship might well require UV, or it might well require EC as the most cost-effective solution. But generally a ship owner will have a range of ships, which might require a different technology choice. So that's the reason we've done that. Um, but clearly the owner's very interested in having a cost-effective solution. So we have to make sure that we supply a cost-effective CapEx solution for him, which is buying the, the technology itself. Um, that's the reason why we have a modular approach. We try to standardize our design and keep the cost base down. But in terms of extending that service, we do offer also retrofit services. So not just something applicable for new build, but also applicable for the existing fleets. And clearly as Botsuna, we have the option of providing support, both technical and service support, throughout the lifetime of the ship. So we're there as a total solution provider, not just supplying the product itself. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, are there any questions from the floor? Darren, are you still around? Have you got any questions for, for, for Joe, maybe? Something that you think we, we might have missed? Yeah, yeah. yeah I think uh, maybe it's worth uh, questioning uh, the, the, the need for, for the UV side of things. Uh, if, if the US, like, like you stated, if the US uh, are question, questioning the use of UV, uh, why do we really need the, the two choices, or to, you know, as a as a solid approach? You know, if I take a bit of a philosophical approach to answering this in the first part, and I'm a doctor, so I can do that. Um, if you look around, all of us generally, if you look in the industrial sector, if you look in our homes, even. Um, there's two ways of approaching disinfection, two popular ways. One of them is actually using bleach. We use that regularly in the house, we use it in the hospitals, we use it in swimming pools. Um, UV is also used as a disinfection tool. So for me, those two technologies are very, very well tried and tested throughout life and throughout different applications. And there's absolutely no reason why you can't use both for ballast water as well. The whole issue in the US with UV is a little bit unfortunate, I think, um, you have some lawmakers that perhaps didn't understand the technology that made decisions or comments early on that weren't perhaps completely appropriate. And I don't think their intention was to um, stop people using UV as a technology choice for ballast. But clearly there is a position being made that's now difficult to reverse. So it's going to be more challenging. I think in the US, um, it's not a case that they will not allow UV, but there might be some limitations on what you need to do as a UV supplier. And actually for the small ships, the UV solution is a very cost-effective solution. So it is useful to have that. And from our side, I see that there will be a need for it from our customer base, and therefore we have to have it available. So hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Darren. Okay, please join me in thanking Joe Thomas for our Q&A session on ballast water management systems. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Okay, and that concludes our stand program for today. Um, as you can see, there's a, there, there are drinks out, there are snacks out, so please help yourself. Uh, do uh, look for the speakers who presented today if you've got any questions for them, um, or you can, you can always approach me and I can direct you to the right person. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you. See you tomorrow.